Welcome to a new episode of Open Talk podcast by Sport React. In the last few episodes of uh, online podcast, we had some amazing coaches. Uh, the last episode, coach uh, Jeffrey Pools from the Chicago Bulls. Today, we continue with another great one. We have the director of performance from uh, Fenerbahce Beko, uh, coach uh, Costas. As well, he is the director of the Euroleague Strength and Conditioning Coach Association. Thank you very much for your time and for giving us the opportunity to learn from you. Uh, thank you for having me. Amazing. Pleasure. Amazing. So we are a little bit on a time limit. It's pretty late in Istanbul as well as here in, in Zagreb. So we'll go straight straight to the first topic. So. What I'm interested, you were for a pretty long time now in, in the Euroleague system. You were there uh, before the new format that was presented in 2016. So if you can maybe give to people that no, don't know uh, how did it look prior, how does it look now when it comes to uh, the volume of the games and everything that you have to go through uh, in, in the season. Everything in life, uh, basketball in the Euroleague is evolving. Uh, as you mentioned, the biggest change was the, the change in the system uh, of competition that happened, I think, in 2017, where it used to be a you know, system where teams were divided into several groups. Mm -hmm. And then you go from phase one to top 16, where things started to warm up, let's say. Uh, the, uh, games became, uh, winning games became. Uh, more important because it has smaller uh, margin of error and then you go to the playoffs and then to the final four well what this did was uh, eventually the first round was always I, uh, that is between October and December games were kind of easier because it was the whole team all the teams in the Euroleague the weaker the really weaker and stronger teams all divided in groups so in your group you had a couple of games that were pretty much easy and there were for sure less games so the first the first round was kind of like uh, I, I have to say it was easier. Then after around uh, around January, the leagues uh, the games. So that was the second round. The best teams from the groups qualified to the second round. Mm -hmm. So then you had to face better teams, and then this would uh, this would define which position we're gonna get in the playoffs. So the the take home message was that half the season was not that hard. The games were less. There was less. They were less frequent. You had a, a, a larger margin of error. Uh, and then it became more serious right around February, January. Uh, when the system changed to round robin, which means that uh, it's 18 teams right now, it used to be, I think, 16 before. Okay. Uh, and then everybody plays everybody every week, and then they introduce the double weeks. So now, if you put in the equation that we have to play for the local league, you have three to four games per, per week. So in 10 days, you might play five games. And that changed everything, okay? It changes the way we practice, it changes the way we prepare, the way the teams build the, uh, are, are built. It changes, um, let's say, the uh, how important, uh, actually, it changes the phases of the season in terms of when is it important to lose games or not to lose games, when is it important to to be what we call in shape, and that is towards March. Mm -hmm. and we see teams that are you know, seven, eighth in the positioning, and then they have a great month in February and March, and they... They, they finally end up being higher in the in the standings. So, and, and on the contrary, sometimes teams have a great start. They they go well, they go in streaks and winning streaks, and then they lose so the next couple of months. They, they are unrecognizable. A lot of variables uh, that you can control get into the game. Uh, injuries a huge part of it because uh, another uh, another factor is that before with the with the previous system, if we talk about injuries. If a player got injured and, and let's say they have to lose 10 days, okay, in those 10 days you might have two or three games. Now in these 10 days you might have five games or yeah. four games and, and two at home against, uh, let's say, uh, similar the teams that have similar goals with you and then if the, your key player loses these games, that's much more important than losing a game that is not that important for the previous system. So everything changed and there's not a lot of practice anymore. So we have game, rest, game, rest, one practice, game, rest, and, and so on and so forth. Getting closer to, to let's say, an NBA model, um, but uh, this has changed a lot the way uh, European coaches view the game. And it took a while because, obviously, if you're used to, to practicing a lot, uh, 
and then you play, and then you practice again. Now the system changed. You still practice how you did practice, and now it's more more low to the players. Uh, it was uh, for the team. For example, I was in Ceska, Moscow for eight years, mm -hmm. and we lost one game every two months with the previous system. And when we lost, it was disaster. You know, we watched three hours film with coach and, and everything. Now we can't do that because you, my goal is very very typical. In, uh, in the EuroLeague system, actually most teams go into winning streaks and losing streaks. So you might lose three four games in a row, one in the EuroLeague, then in a local league. You go away uh, and play again, you lose. So you can't deal with losses the way you did before, yeah. and you have to keep a better balance. So quite a few things change, but the impact of injuries, the way we practice, uh, and then the teams have to get deeper rosters, more players, uh, and also to improve the function of the whole team so that that again falls into our category you know you need more physios you need more strength coaches you need better travel conditions you need uh, nutrition if you want to win yeah and that is, is is gradually being evaluated more and more that if you have goals you can you gotta fly charter you can't be catching those super early morning flights or sleep for three hours and then go straight to the airport and so on and so forth so you can't handle a team of 15 people or 14 people that's the roster of a typical EuroLeague team with one physio. Yeah. In our team, in Fenerbahce, we have 10 people, 10 professionals that work to support the players. It's three physios, two masters, one doctor, three strength conditioning personnel, and one nutritionist. Mm -hmm. Okay. Now it creates the, the need for, 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 manage, for managing the system and uh, giving the right budget to, to, uh, to function because everybody needs their, we need supplements for the nutritionist, we need uh, equipment for us, technology, and, and so on and so forth. So, big changes in, in with the, just with the, by, by changing the system. Yeah. So, how did your part of the job uh, change from that format to this? So let's say, let's take a week or a month of your work in the previous format and now. How much more or less job do you do you have to do with the guys off the court? Well, it has. I, don't, I can't quantify it, but it's significantly more. That's why um, I think more, most of the EuroLeague teams now have at least two strength and conditioning coaches. It used to be that it was, you know, when I started, it was the head coach, a couple of assistants, a physio, a part-time doctor, and a strength coach. Okay, now our job as strength and conditioning coaches has evolved tremendously because we do a lot of things. Uh, first of all, we have to train the players. We have to train the team as a team. And then we have to train the individual groups that uh, the separate groups that are created within this team and need special attention. Mm -hmm. The injured players, so the injured players need to work extra. On another time, then the, the whole team works the same in the weight room because they need special attention. And if it's a difficult case, you have to bring them one by one, so it spreads out. Then you have to do the the, the, the post rehab training. You have to work with the players that don't play, and this is a very significant. Uh, let's say point, of, and it's a big difference from the US because in most European teams you have, the let's say let's take the highest level, right, the, the 18 EuroLeague teams. You play in the EuroLeague and you play in your local league. There are restrictions in the, in the restrictions in the local league of how many foreigners, non-local players, mm -hmm. uh, you can use. So we have nine foreigners, we can use only five. So when we play in a Turkish league, you got five, four or five guys that don't play. The same goes for the local players that, you know, you have a roster of 12 and they don't participate in the EuroLeague games because they're out of the roster, because the foreigners take their place, or they're in the roster and don't play a lot. Yeah. So imagine a double week, which is you play Tuesday, Thursday in, in the EuroLeague, and then Saturday you get a local league game. So from Monday to Friday, the players that don't play these games need to work. They don't participate, they don't get loaded enough. Okay, so now you have to worry about these players. What do they do? Do they train after the game? Do, you, do they train at a different time? So another, you got the, uh, yeah, like, see, infiltration of technology, which is a great thing. So now, not only do we have to get educated about new things like that, data handling, uh, force plates, and whatever is, is coming, and it's, it's coming like a tsunami, as everybody says, uh, new technologies, data, and so on and so forth. You have to, to handle that decide what you want to do, what you want to measure, what you want to track, learn about it, and then do it. And then you have to also um, plan, help the coaches plan, plan the practice, uh, plan the loading, uh, what we're going to do this week, next week, or the week after that, 
if you can play that that far ahead. You have to communicate with the management. You got to communicate up about injured players, about the condition of the players. You got to communicate with the with the physios and the doctors, and you have to have a system to do that. Yeah. Okay. So where do you log everything? So every you have nine people or eight people working on the players. How do you know what everybody's doing on the players? It's one human body that gets a lot of input: physio, doctor, strength coach. How do you know what everybody's doing? So there are systems for that. After the management system and things like that. The strength coach is right at the middle of it. Why? And then now some doctors would argue, so, you know, it's a, who can be, let's say, who, who must be a director of performance? Who can be at the top of this, you know, group of doctors, physios, and, and all that? And I'd say that probably the strength coach because we are, at the end of the day, responsible for, human, for players' performance and have <clears throat> anything that will affect their performance, we must know. Yeah. Right? So if so the doctor will give us the diagnosis or, or the condition or the physio, but at the end of the day, we're deciding it. It's us that we have to kind of see how we're going to apply this uh, this information to the practice and what we're going to tell coach. And the strength and conditioning coach is the, the intermediate between the coach and the medical staff, the coach and the players, and the coach and the management in term, in, for things, performance. Okay, Obviously, if there's a medical issue, the, the doctor is going to inform everybody. But at the end... We are at the middle of this hub where we have to communicate in all directions and make decisions. Decision making was not that big before. Now it's huge. Okay, is this player ready to play or not? Is this injured player coming back from the injuries ready to, to play? Because you're the last part, at least the last part of, of, of the return to play process is 100% strength coach. You do communicate with everybody every day, but it's you. Yeah. Okay, testing, things like that. So decision making, and in all organizations, the people that make decisions are, are more important in the hierarchy, and they should be, be paid accordingly, in my opinion, of course, and they have to, to, to leave the status of all oh, the strength and conditioning codes, the fitness codes that just are stretching and you know, body fat, <laughs> things like that, to coach, and get the, the status of a coach, of a leader, of a person that is in charge of things, and not just this this you know, this guy, this girl, whoever, just does stretching and it's just a muscle pound guy. And it's up to us also to stand uh, uh, to to fulfill this role. So that's a different True. conversation. What is our responsibility to to be able to to fulfill those this role in this in its richness? True, <clears throat> amazing answer. To stay a little bit uh, more on on this topic, I'm interested since you were there from the beginning of of that new format. What was something, if there was something, that you suggested to the head coach to maybe do differently, to have a little bit different approach when the new format of more games uh, with uh, bigger frequency uh, came? Well, it, it. Mm -hmm. because um, we didn't know what was coming. Yeah. Okay. We didn't. We didn't really know what was coming, so we kind of learned on the fly. We uh, started to adapt. We saw that that it, you know you have to take care of travel and you have to take care of, of practices, and you, we have to now find a way to monitor performance, and we have to uh, uh, you know do all these things that we talked about in in, in the previous in my previous answer. So I can't really say that uh, right right off the bat. Say so, you know, coach, this is what's going to happen. This is what we have to do, but. We constantly adapting to the new situations, and it's different situation in Russia, different situation in Turkey, different in Spain, uh, depending on the local league and the organization and the capabilities of the club. But um, we had to learn on the fly, and the, the first major adjustment we did was practice time, mm -hmm. practice intensity, and the way we uh, we the, obviously practice less. Not, you know, we used to lift in the morning, for example, and then. Uh, practice in the afternoon because we had ample time we had time to rest now we just have one big session we realized that we have to take care of the nutrition better we realized that we have to take off traveling better so if we arrive at home after 4 a.m and because we like it to charter most of the flights we will stay the night on our destination where we played and fly in the morning because we want guys to sleep i know there's a big debate over that but that's what we do yeah. Um, we had to get a deeper roster. We had to be smart with players that get a lot of minutes and a lot of training, and that all the indications show us that they're overtrained. And we can talk about that. Overtrained—that's a wrong word. They're um, 
let's say, low, o- o- overloaded, and they're in danger of having you know weaker performance or even get hurt, then we're we're smarter to pull them out of practice. And that's a huge step from the coach's side because coaches want to play the practice the players. They want to practice the strategy. When when you tell a coach that I want the player to rest or we should practice less, what they hear is we're going to be unprepared. Because at, at least in our system, practice is not just running and, and running our stuff and, and just getting there randomly. It's targeted. We work on the opponent, on the stuff that we're going to do, offense, defense, and all the situation. That takes time. And it takes repetitions to, to be able to. And that's why when we have time in ahead of us, we're one of the best prepared teams in Europe, the guy to lead, uh, because of the coaches. But now you don't have that luxury. So when you tell the player, the coach that is planning to stay out, he hears that, hey, we're going to be unprepared because my key player doesn't know the strategy. So now for my part, for our part, from the performance part, we have to be very smart on how we communicate that to each coach. Mm-hmm. That's why... This, this relationship must be tight and that's a huge uh, that's another big topic to talk about yeah do you have a say when it comes to which players will sit out maybe the domestic league game if they play let's say Euro League uh, do, do you sure yeah? um, I'm lucky to, to be with coach now 10 years and there's a common language and there's a, a trust that uh, that has been built over these years of you know, knowledge, experience, and knowing that there's no other agenda in the on the table. That, for example, trying to be, you know, you know, friendly to the player, be liked by the by the players. Mm-hmm. It's just only what's best for the team, for the coach, and the, and, and the players. So I do have uh, an input, which means that if I believe that somebody is better to see out a game because they are overloaded or they're mentally loaded, that's that's a big part, <clears throat> and we don't want somebody to be just physically in the game but we want them to perform then I'll put on my suggestions and if that coincides with, with the dynamic of the game then it's going to be heard it doesn't mean that every time I say these guys are going to stay out they're out no coach has his own all coaches um, they have their own way of, of viewing the game and I totally understand it Yeah. and sometimes I was insisting on somebody to stay out and they played and coach was 100% right because they played well and they, they had to play in order to win and other times it was the opposite but um, coach, I'm lucky because whatever I tell him, even if he doesn't like it, and he's not very polite when he hears it, but he ends up listening and he's very open to, to things that will help the team and will help him, even though he might react in the beginning. <laughs> yeah. Okay, to go a little bit uh, of that topic, I'm interested when it comes to pre-practice and game preparation. Uh, what, why and how do you do? Uh, how uh, many hours before the game are you there to prepare everything and what's your approach with, with that? Well, we start from the, starting from the game. Uh, the game is a, is a ritual uh, for most players. They, do, they would like to do the same stuff. From our part, if we play, uh, we, we meet uh, one hour and 45 minutes before the game. Mm-hmm. If we're at home, we have a, a amazing new facility where the locker room, the physio room and the weight room are in the same spot, amazing. the same area. It's all connected. So we can um, shift the players from the physio room uh, to the strength and conditioning, to the to the weight room, and then to the on the court. So the, the pre-game preparation is a little bit different for every player. For example, we have players that come three hours before the game and, and get the shots up, get a good sweat, go back, do their do the therapy on the, on the you know, on the... Um, uh, spots that they need to have ser- th- therapy and then they come and do some exercises others don't do exercises and what the general so it's individualized that's the first take-home message uh, usually uh, players work on their either the sites of, of previous injuries or, or perceived weakness somebody has Achilles issues they do uh, exercise for the Achilles other guys that are healthier they're just going to do some general uh, body um, full body exercise I don't want to call them activation because mm-hmm. activation in my book has a different meaning so preparation um, <clears throat> and then they go and play on the road it's a similar process but it's harder because we don't have our, our environment so the guys will work with the physios that we have we're there 1 hour 45 minutes before the game everybody's going to do their own uh, mobility and flexibility work they're going to do the whatever we do for, for preparation to get uh, the muscles going on the court stuff, shooting, dribbling, each player has their own routine, and then we're going to do our team warm up. And sometimes, um, you, 
may seem that our yearly in general in, in our world looks, some guys might be late, look lazy and they don't go 100% but we might not forget that they were there an hour ahead of that time that you yeah. see them doing their work but they already did their mobility they already did what they did so this you know lazy stretching that with dynamic stuff and just people that look lazy sometimes it's mostly because they they just did a lot of stuff right before that now the question is why would you keep doing it and that's a good question because it's tradition that we have to do something to, to raise the body temperature and blah 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 and then we have to stretch or dynamic now the last 15 years at least and, and then we do whatever we do so maybe we have, we have to change this model because I'm telling you except for a couple of guys everybody else have done their work that's why warm ups are getting shorter and shorter because yes. you know we don't need to do 30 minutes we do roughly 20 and that's to me that's maybe too much <laughs> yeah Sometimes and guys like it because they they're an hour ahead, and then you have to be careful so they stay hydrated and they keep uh, getting uh, energy. Uh, in, in, so keeping themselves and keeping the energy levels uh, high, so because if you work an hour before the game, then you are three hours on the court, right? So you need to get that under consideration. So this is pretty much what we do before games. Okay, thank you for the answer. I talked with uh, Coach Jeffrey. Uh, about a topic when it comes to isometric work for players who have patellar tendinopathy or some problems with Achilles tendons and similar uh, and I'm interested uh, if they if players have a routine of using those isometric exercises in a preparation for a game do you use it closer to game time do you use it uh, separately when it's team warm-up they do it aside some few exercises of isometric holds and similar how do you put that in in the game day yeah, let's say prep yeah. well obviously you don't wait in the game day to do your stuff right yeah but isometrics in some cases have been shown to help with tendon issues um and isometric is a, a general a, a good way and i'm going to use that word activate the muscles and we have a whole range of, of isometric exercises that we do based on um, uh, both the, based on positioning the, the, the joints in, the, in those positions that we usually test them. Okay? Mm -hmm. So I don't want to get into that, but uh, we do use isometrics, yeah, isometrics uh, for, for foot muscles, for ankle muscles, for, for uh, the muscles that cross the, the ankle joint and end up all the way down, so lower lower leg, let's say, um, uh, muscles, and we use it in the classical form with you know, uh, holds of, of certain seconds with, with a certain load, and we use it uh, with manual resistance, and that is what we call activation exercises, it has to do with the gamma loop, with the gamma motor neurons, and just given a neural input to muscles that might be not getting uh, the, the, the right input because of injury, because of misuse, or uh, because of some other reason. Mm -hmm. And uh, we do that especially when we have guys coming from injuries. So, for example, if somebody has have twisted their ankle, and they are but they are active, they're going to play. But we evaluate that the, the muscles around the joint, because of that injury, doesn't get the right neural input. So the peroneus longus test weak on a on a manual muscle test or. Uh, the tibialis anterior or the tibialis posterior and that's, that's how we use isometrics very very targeted when we talk about tendinopathy yes we do isometrics obviously before the game okay you just warm up and maybe has a little bit of a pain reducing effect mm -hmm. but the major work needs to happen for that and you need to try to establish why this is happening looking at the mechanics of the knee of the ankle usually that's where the, pro the problem is or in the hip and then try to intervene uh, in, in, in a lot of multiple levels. So it's never one thing. Definitely. Uh, you worked last few summers with the uh, Greek national team, uh, as well as you are in, in Fenerbahce still. So uh, what would be the biggest difference when it comes to working with a national team and a uh, team that plays EuroLeague, EuroCup, NBA? So the teams that, that you are together for a month, maybe two months, depending on the tournament, and with somebody that you are almost almost the whole year, nine, nine months. Yeah, that's another, that's another uh, yes, it's a different environment, and that's the great thing about being, having been 
exposed to, to all these uh, different environments from training individual athletes, training uh, a team that, that plays four, four games in 10 days or plays one, one game per week, and then the national team that gathers uh, for a month and a half, and they have one goal that is a tournament of seven to 15 days, and you're lucky to get all to go all the way. So basically, um, the biggest difference is that when you get when you work in the national team, you don't have time to interact with the players. Mm-hmm. So it comes down to managing their habits, trying to understand really quick what condition everybody's into. Because in, here in Europe, we start uh, we finish the leagues. All, all the leagues finish around between 15 and 20, roughly of June. National teams usually start in the middle of July, so you get this month. Uh, if players are lucky to get a month, that guys are either not in the teams, they're on vacation. And so they will show up in in the national team. Now, you have to really uh, quickly establish what condition they're in. Of course, we, we contacted as many as we could and asked them what, what they, that they did, gave them programs and blah, blah. But, you know, when they show up, you have to really understand where everybody is. Mm-hmm. And then you have to handle, A, the total training load, and uh, B, their injuries, and C, uh, C you know, is the, the weight room. So... I'm never, starting from the weight room, I didn't want to, uh, I, I just wanted to follow what they were doing the whole year, even if it was not exactly on my philosophy and my belief, let's say, or I don't like the word belief, but okay, let's say belief. Okay. Uh, because it's no time. If we live five times, I'm not going to just, okay, well, let's start Olympic lifting, for example, or you're doing this wrong, or I believe you should be doing that. I asked everybody, what are you doing? Uh, many many players didn't have a structured program, so we jump right in and structure it for them. And then I designed the programs based on their habits. And I was lucky because in Greek national team, I knew most of the players. A lot of them I coached in the past when they were younger, so I kind of know them personally. So there's a trust in, involved, and also know their bodies pretty much. And you have to adapt to that. Then you have to consult the coach to run practices where. Even if somebody's not that well prepared, they will still be able to progressively get better and not get injured. And another mistake, and which we made in the first year, was just to to go all out. You know, so this is what we should be doing in the preseason. And then it was for some guys to watch. Mm-hmm. This is the national team. Also, the drive of some of these players are is different because uh, they all want to play, but they're not gonna push the envelope that much. So if somebody's in pain, they're not gonna practice and they're gonna take care of the body because winter is more important and that's yeah. understandable I'm saying it with a, with a positive tone right I'm, I don't mean anything bad by this I would do the same thing so that's also another another thing to handle it you have to be smart on how you work on the course for example this year in this in our preparation to the World Cup we didn't run any extra conditioning drills mm-hmm. I incorporated a few of my pieces into the team practice and we have you know, all, all of our conditioning happened while we played basketball. We measured everything. We tried to, to work with, uh, with appropriate workloads and, and get the right adaptations, but there was uh, no no extra conditioning. Also, in, in Fenerbahce, in our preparation, and there was no extra conditioning. I think this is something that is shifting also in this at this, at this level of play, where players play continuously. Yeah. Mm-hmm. You mentioned uh, something interesting, uh, trust. Uh, when it comes to working with players, uh, do you think that it impacts maybe the their performance when it comes to off court stuff? Uh, how 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 much do they trust the coach that they work with? That's the uh, th- that's the uh, the most important thing. Is it's even more important how, how much stuff you know. And I know that when we all started, and still now, we want to be the smartest, the best educated get our degrees, get our, our, our titles and our masters and our PhDs and all that stuff. Well, that's very important. Our job is the job that you need to know and you got to keep learning because things evolve very fast, A and B. The human body is so complex. And in order to decide about human performance, you have to have a very, very, very wide view. You have to be a generalist and a specialist at the same time. But even if you are, and everything is great, and you're a smart, smart coach, if you can connect with the players, if the players don't feel that you are going to help them, either because they see that you have your own agenda, or you don't have good communication skills, and they don't trust you, you better go out and teach, do seminars, you know, be a professor, which you also have to communicate because you have your your uh, your, your students, and I 
to have total respect for professors. But if you can't impact your players, then then you lose all all this knowledge. Yeah. So the number one thing is try to connect with the players, all of them, most of them, or uh, just develop the, these skills. And it takes practice. It's no, it, some people are, are talented and naturally talented. Uh, but even if you're talented in communication and, and interpersonal skills, is you still have to put your your head down and think how you're going to resolve crisis, how you're going to um, deal with different cultures. And now basketball is is a multicultural event. Yeah, you got uh, people from different group, uh, social groups, ethnic groups, uh, ethnicity, uh, passports, and ages. So in our team, we have an 18-year-old and a 35-year-old, completely different, different generations. And then as you grow older, then you you see that dynamic shifting because when I was a younger coach, for example, I was very good and, and really connected with the younger players because we were similar age. We had the same interests, we talked the, the same language, let's say. Well, as I grew older and you know the newer players got started coming in, I, yeah. I saw it as a little bit of... of uh, let's say not distant, but it was. It's a different language. It's a different dynamic between us. So that's that's, that's also something that you have to to really um, address, right? So trust is huge, and if you, if the players don't feel that you're there for them, that you care for them, you know, if they don't care how much you know until they know how much you care, this is something that goes around, and it's a saying, a quote that goes around in coaching, and it's absolutely right that's how you start i care about you yeah Um, i ask you how you are i come close i'm honest i'm i'm uh, i have a i have integrity so i'm not going to tell you something and go to coach and say something else Uh, and the the player won't realize that hey whatever i'm saying here in the waking somehow i hear back from the coaches we we stop in the well it's 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 it's, uh, the strength coach but then your loyalty is also to the coaching staff. So you do have to convey some stuff that happened in the way, but you have to filter that. So again, communication, management, interpersonal skill, away from the X's and O's. Then you have this doctor that has his own ego and the physio, and then you have to work with them. So, well, it, it's coaching. It's, it's personality at the end of the day. Yeah, you mentioned the, the topic that I wanted to go through as well when it comes to education. Something that I like to ask coaches that are in the field for many, many years and have been successful and have amazing experiences, something that I've been thinking about a lot in, in the past few months even, uh, is uh, that educational part, but when it comes to getting a job, staying uh, at the job and impacting the team, the coaches, the players in a positive way. How would you rank for a strength and conditioning coach specifically here? Uh, the four, four stuff that I think are important. So formal education, when it comes to getting a degree, bachelor, masters, uh, self-education in that we can put uh, courses, books, maybe even mentors who mentor you through, through your way. Uh, experience and characteristic as a person what would you say is the most important of that for for getting a job and staying staying there and being good at it well it's a good question um, but they all have their importance man. It's a boring yeah answer. definitely <laughs> but a different stage um, Every, every every one of these factors that you mentioned play a role. So your, your your formal education, your degrees are the base. This is not to say that people that didn't get their masters or didn't get their PhDs are less. But the truth is that if you're a person that likes to learn, it's better to spend your, 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 your valuable years of formal education, which is between 18 and 22, let's say 23, to get your bachelor's. And then the next three, four, five years, three, four years, depending on when you do your, your postgraduate work, mm-hmm. to do it on something meaningful and valuable for the profession. So if you go, so if you have a, a general uh, physical education degree, which this is what most of us or all of us did, you know, we got this, you know, base courses of anatomy and biomechanics and all that stuff. And then you better spend your time learning something that's going to be very useful, biomechanics, exercise physiology. Now. Maybe somebody wants to go into data, and then you do your, your PhD or, or whatever you want to do. So this is the base, and I think this is very important. And because 
it's not only the knowledge, the, the crude knowledge that you get, uh, the formal education, it's about the people that you're going to meet. If you go, let's say, to a school that has a big, in America, or a big college that has a big sports program. Mm-hmm. Well, I, I want to check, it was heaven. We had Angel Spasov, I think he sadly passed away, great uh, weightlifting coach from Bulgaria. The, Dan Pfaff was there. Dan Pfaff coaching the track guys. So here, here, here you're watching, I'm watching Todd Wright, who was my mentor and friend, you know, he's the vice president of health and performance at the Clippers. Mm-hmm. And that was my mentor. And he was right there, you know, interacting with Todd. And then he pays Dan Pfaff and I hear him speak and I see him coach. So it's not the knowledge that I got from this great university. It's also who I got to interact with, new technologies, things like that, going to conferences and being exposed uh, yeah. to, to a lot of stuff. Okay, so now that that's the formal education I think is very important. And that's a great thing to have when you start uh, and you meet people, you get references. Uh, if you finish a, a school that has a reputation that is also good, you're a graduate of this school, usually if you graduate the school, it means that you're, you know, say, good. But anyways, I don't believe there's a direct relationship, but anyways. Now, what you learn after that is huge because you're not 25, and if you want to work for another 30 years, <laughs> you have to keep learning because things change. And there's so much stuff that you, you need to learn. So you have to, to constantly be hungry for new knowledge and find a way to systematize, to systemize how you learn. Picking up articles randomly and, and, and reading and learning uh, and reading and, and just getting all this input. And nowadays it's so distracted Yeah. because we got a, a bombardment of new things, of new technologies, and everything looks so cool and everything looks so valid, and we get drawn. Our attention gets drawn. I was I was speaking to this. Uh, uh, I was at this uh, event a couple of days ago in Greece in Athens, and one of the uh, the students approached me and asked, "How do I? You know, I feel that it's so much. I, where do I focus that? I mean, we keep do BFR, do uh, velocity based training, do isometrics. I like, get this course on isometrics." Uh, and everybody now find a way to monetize all these knowledge. It's great. It's great to have it. But it doesn't mean, uh, you ask me about isometrics, it's a tiny part of what we do. Very important. you got to understand it. Okay, you know, to understand it, you need to study it. But you need to have the ability to, to put things in order, say, I will learn this, find the right sources. There's a million of courses now out there, but who's going to teach you? Yeah. Are they valid? What, what's their agenda? Okay, so are they scientific? and? Well, what's the deal? That's why I believe that in those formal years, one of the most uh, important lessons, especially which you get if you get into a master's or a PhD level, is to learn how to read st- uh, studies, learn statistics. It's something that I, I fall in love much later in my career. I realized, hey, you, you don't know stats, that you, you can't read articles. You, you know, your thinking is not so structured and this, you don't ask the right questions. So learn how to learn. Self-learning is huge, and that is combined to experience because experience would direct you to what you want to learn. And the best school is, is, is you know, learning by practice. Well, this didn't work. That didn't work. Shit. What didn't work? Well, uh, I saw this condition. What is this? Con- oh, I need to learn about that stuff. I don't know about tendinopathy. I don't know about reading a, 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 this, uh, let's say, GPS reports of whatever the word there were. Uh, examples, right? Yeah. Every, every word, but then your experience will direct you to what you need to learn. Your experience will build you that confidence that, hey, this is what we do. This is my system. This is how we build it and it works. And, but you have to be humble enough and smart enough to see the gaps. You have to have an ego. You have to be confident because other than that, if you don't have it, you're done. Okay. So if you want to work in the high level, go talk to these superstars. you got to have ego. Then I said, oh, leave your ego out the door. No, bring it in with you because you're going to need it. Because when these players... Act important, you gotta act important. So to speak, of course you don't brag. Yeah, yeah. You know, say that you have to have a your own you gotta be able to hold your own. And that takes a strong personality, that's ego. Okay, but don't let it get into your way and fight with the player or become an ego contest. That, 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 that's the communication that we're talking about. So experience is huge because you build your own system, you know what you, you need to learn and you recognize patterns. And if you wanna understand it, because you're younger, but once you stay in this in the same environment for many years, you'll be able to foresee things. Hey, this happened. Well, this so this injury happened. Yeah, it's 15 days. Well, let's get an MRI. It's 15 days, 90 percent of the time. I've <laughs> seen, I've seen it. I know. Go have an MRI now because 
he does a little bit, he let, he heard, heard a pop on the step, it's a muscle jerk. Well, let's wait and see, no, okay, let's wait and see what it is. Or if we do this, then this will happen. How do you know? Well, you know, th that's a gut feeling that's, that's built from repeating the same patterns over and over again and learning from them because you can repeat the same pattern and not learn. Yeah. You keep doing the mistakes because you refuse to, 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 to accept that you made a mistake. That happens so many times in return to play situation. Well, you know, let's push the guy because we have to get this game. Maybe he's going to be okay. Well, ne it's never going to be okay if, if there's a maybe involved. You know, you, know you, you have to wait. So now, when you go to talk coach and say, hey, it's another five days, and you start getting, oh, wow, you know, we have a game tomorrow. We have coaches five days. It is because if we don't do that, it's going to be an injury 100%. Yeah. And that experience, right? So I had a, a talk with a, another young coach last summer, and he did a master's degree, an undergrad master's, and he did already uh, one internship, and he worked one summer as a volunteer. He said, I'm looking for another internship. He said, don't, don't get another internship. Go get a job. Go, go be responsible. Go, go make your own decisions. Be in this position where you, you have to email people and say, what the hell am I, am I going to do now? I, I, I never encountered this, this situation. And that's how you build your experience. Okay, so uh, it's all connected. And yeah. You have to have this growth and learning mindset. That the, the the mindset that you the more you know and you grow, the more you come in contact with the unknown. So there's so many things that you don't know. Okay. So then you you're humbled and you and you kind of figure out what's important. Okay. I, there's so many things I need to know, but what is the one thing that I have to focus this month or the two things to get me to the next level, to get me to understand a little bit better what is happening. So it takes time, but it, get, it also takes this mindset, I believe. Amazing advice. Uh, and something that helps with knowledge when it comes to strength and conditioning in basketball is definitely what uh, you as a director and uh, some other guys as uh, Luca. Reggie uh, and the rest are trying to do with the EuroLeague Strength and Conditioning Coaches Association uh, is with the summits, with the webinars and everything definitely helping uh, younger coaches, even experienced ones who can learn even more. Can you give us a little bit insight on that? What's the goal with it and how far can it go in, in your mind? Well, that's the main goal. Is, so actually two goals. The one was to be relevant in the EuroLeague. Because there's so many things that are happening, and the thing was becoming, like we said in the uh, what we discussed in our in the, for the you know in the first question that what changed? Well, it changed that we need to the strength and conditioning coaches have a lot of, lot to say about uh, rest times, about when do we need to start preseason, how do we need to travel, and things like that. So uh, we need to have a voice in in the Euroleague to uh, advise and to influence decisions, and also to shed some light. On us, because we're not this, you know, insignificant, quote unquote, professionals. Because no, no person is insignificant, but as a professional, you know, you, you're kind of there. You, you're the strength coach. They don't even call us coaches. As some some uh, uh, teams don't even call coaches the, the strength coaches still. And I give you an example. When we were going um, to the final fours with Cesca, mm -hmm. we get this accreditation. My accreditation said team follower. So it's coach coach team follower and I know that it's okay it's something that is maybe relevant but it goes to show that the people up top they don't see a coach they see a team follower like the physio the equipment guy the physio is not a team follower he's a physiotherapist yeah the doctor is not a team follower he's a doctor okay so that goes to show how we were approaching the part of the, of the goal was to, to raise awareness and because we are the spotlight for the teams that we are and the, 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 the level that would be good for everyone to shed some light. Hey, some, some guys over there, they're highly educated, highly driven, not well paid, most of us, and uh, but they're very relevant and they do a great job in their teams, very, very significant job. Now, the other thing was that we wanted to share our experience and we wanted to open up and we wanted to learn from everybody else because it's a two-way uh, uh, channel. Okay, so when you ask me a question, and I say, huh, I never thought of that. Or I catch myself many times not to be able to explain the, why, why do you do that in the weight room? Why do you do four sets of six? Well, uh, I don't know. So I, I, or I can articulate it. So I, I need yeah. to go back and uh, I, I, don't, I cannot really explain 
every word that I'm saying. I, I can't find meaning to everything that I'm saying. So it's a two-way thing. And uh, we wanted to bring coaches together. We wanted to bring companies together and the whole basketball community in, let's say, one umbrella. And that was the goal of the ACCA. And we're happy that it's growing. Um, our event, our summer events, now again this year is probably going to be again in Prague. That's oh yeah, which comes up the first time. Nice. Uh, sometime in June. Now we have our webinar on the 13th of November again uh, on, on rehab. So we're we're happy to see that we have respond. Uh, we have a following uh, as a, an association, and it's not about the following. It's about the community that we're trying to build for basketball strength. It's not on 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 any person it's just that the group amazing uh to uh, get you <laughs> to where you need to be we'll we'll finish uh, slowly with some let's say quick less serious uh, questions maybe not so much uh sure. specific to the strength and conditioning field so the first one that i had uh if you had an opportunity to have one dinner with some coach, athlete, scientist, musician, whatever, who would it be and why? Wow, one only. One, one only. Look, there's a lot of people that we, I would like to speak. Um, I'll just say for coach, I, I, I'll make a dribble and, I, and, I, and I'll say two. One is, uh, I would like to, to, to speak, to talk, to have a, a dinner with Nick Saban. Okay. Nick Saban is the, the, the football coach of, of the University of Alabama. And he's a coach that I, he's very successful in college sports. He's been there forever. And I love the way he thinks and the way he runs his team. Totally different environment. I understand that. But that's a guy that I, whenever I hear him speak, I, I listen. And then I'll be, I'll just go a little bit more mainstream and I would like to have a, a nice dinner with Jordan Peterson. Okay. Um, so, yeah. Yeah, love, love him or hate him. It's very interesting. So that's one other person that I would like to, to sit down and talk to. Of course, it's been... There many others, but these two will suffice. <laughs> good answer, good answer. Uh, as a fan, not as a coach, uh, what do you prefer when it comes to basketball? Euroleague or NBA? I'm biased, and I'll say Euroleague because I live in it, and I think it's, I understand it better. Uh, I'll just pick uh, Euroleague in any day and NBA Finals. Oh, okay. That's a good one. Uh, your all-time starting five. Who would be there? Europe? All time. NBA, Europe, whatever. Whoever you want to put there. Be, how, how can I say this without being unfair to also some guys that I that I coach? Okay, let's stick to the current generation because I don't want to okay. go back to Gallis. Okay. Because most, most of you people your age don't understand that. Drazen Petrovic and, and these, these guys were amazing. This is my generation. Uh, let's let's stay with 2000 on. I would pick Vasilis Panoulis. Okay. I would pick Nando De Colo. Okay. That will Interesting. Pick out uh, Dimitris Diamandidis, which is an amazing guy. Tejan Bodiro, that would put him in there. Uh, for. Wow. Would be Kriapa, would be Fotis. Okay. Uh, and then number five, who you could put in Pekovic, put it at the center. Interesting. So Europeans. Interesting yeah, five. So NBA is so many guys like Jordan, Kobe. Yeah. Uh, Giannis, you got to put in Giannis because of LeBron and Shaq. But I'm interested. It's only five. But I'm interested. <laughs> although you said 2000 and later. Point guard doesn't matter. Kobe will bring the ball down. Yeah. Yeah. It's Kobe and Jordan the same five, man. Yeah. You figure it out. Although uh, 90s, 80s were, were far away from my time, uh, as a basketball fan, uh, when it comes to highlights and similar, uh, I mostly enjoy that time of basketball. So uh, my, my, my favorite player is Dražen Petrovic, not just because he's Croatian, but just because he, he, he was, was great. He was a mastermind. Dražen, I, I saw him play live on TV, I'd say. I, never, I was younger also, you know, 80s, yeah. not as much into basketball. But it was a different era, and these guys were great. And uh, the, the thing you mentioned, you, the, the word highlights. In my generation, I don't look like fucking, you know, I'm, I'm old. <laughs> but we didn't watch highlights. We watched the game. Yeah. Highlights. We would wake up in the 90s. 
uh, you would just wait for the, the, the satellite TV that you might have at 4 a.m. to watch the Bulls play against the Pistons, to play against Utah. You just watch the game, and you just knew it. I knew every player. I knew every player, the roster of the NBA and most college teams. Why? Because there were these magazines once a month or once every two months in Greece that you, you know, that's the only source of basketball knowledge. So you read all of it, right? So you read all of it in this weekly magazine. Yeah. And you will read all of it. So you go on and just know everything. Now you bombard it. True. With clips, this, this, this. Players change teams so often that you lose track. Where, where is this guy right now? Where, where's James Harden now? Plays somewhere. I don't know. In Philadelphia still? I, I don't know. But Magic Johnson stayed with the Lakers for 10 years. Larry Bird, Jordan, uh, Kobe. Uh, you, you could connect. And this is happening also in the EuroLeague. It's starting to, to shift. For one year, two years, different team, different team, different team. And you see the successful teams have their, their core of the players mm. remain the same. Yeah. And that's great for, for, for sport, for, for performance, but it's also great for the fans because they can really relate to the players. Yeah. So we, I think it's a, it's a big difference how we consume the product. Definitely. Back then and now. Definitely. So uh, from everything what you said at the beginning, uh, I assume you're a, a very busy guy. So I'm interested, how, how do you spend your free time? Well, most of the time, I now have uh, twin boys, I have two kids, Okay. so my time is, is uh, dedicated to them, but I make sure to work out myself, I love it, I love working out outdoors, mm-hmm. so that's my um, my my own time, uh, during the season, I find those small moments of 30 minutes or 45 minutes just to be by myself, exercise, take a walk, read a book, uh, if I have that, uh, that time, and that's what I do, if I have more time, I'll go skiing, I love skiing, and Amazing. in the summer, we travel. I try to, to do some traveling, uh, see new places. It also, I try to al- always involve some kind of adventure in it because ah, okay. I'm an adrenaline junkie, I guess, and I wanted things to be hard, to be fun. <laughs> <laughs> so some kind of, you know, we did kayaking trip a few di- a few years ago with my buddies and mountain body biking trips and things like that. So amazing. Uh, but it's not not a lot of, of free time. I'm one of these people that I really love what I do, and I really love. All the stuff that I do, like the, the this association, eats up a lot of my free time, let's say. But it's something that fulfills me, and I feel great at the end of the day. And I don't need to, you know, go out and have drinks all yeah. the time or just chill and watch movies. That, that's my fun. Right now, I'm having fun. Something I love doing. You know, I'm having fun. That's amazing. So, uh, we have three more minutes, so the last question. Let's shoot. A last question that we like to ask. Every guest, Croatian, international, doesn't matter. It's a little bit deeper one, so you can give yourself at least a minute <laughs> to think about it. Uh, how would you like to be remembered when it's all said and done from the family part, job part, as a friend? What would you like people to say uh, about Costas? Well, that's a deep one. Uh, I'll start from the family. Uh, just, uh, you know, when t- time is up, I like to be remembered as a, a good father and a good husband and somebody that was uh, useful to the, to the growth of the, of the children, uh, gave them strength and compassion and love and gave them the right tools to, to face the world. And that, to me, that's the biggest, if that, and I'm not going to be around to, to see it, probably, but if that happens, that'd be the biggest success in my life. Um, and just to be able to keep the family together along with my wife on this long and difficult journey. So in the family, I would like to be remembered like that, just uh, a good father and, and a good husband. Amazing. And uh, the head of the comp- the head of the family, let's say, <laughs> not in a sexist way, just somebody that really drove it to the to, to where it needs to go. Singler uh, goes out as a coach. I would like to be remembered like a person that always that had an impact with to to a lot of people and. At the later stages, start acting like a mentor, and people won't remember if you taught them the, the hand clean or you conditioned them right. But they're gonna remember how how you made them grow or not grow, how you made them feel, and if you were fair. And if at the end of the day, even though you were you had these moments, these clashes, you, because you pushed people to be the, the best, uh, it came out to their benefit. And that's that's what kids and, and players look back and say. You know what, this guy that we had over there. 
and I really didn't like them back then because he always pushed me and he, and he was pitching when I was not on time and you know what that guy was he was right and this is why how we feel with our parents when we cross I say that age yeah. you know mid 20s like, you know what hey, just everything they say is pretty much true and <laughs> if you're lucky right so I want to be remembered as, as a coach that helped help the players and help the teams win and help the coaches uh, win and I was always there responsible and and taking responsibility for, for whatever happened and just was somebody that was always had a positive uh, impact on wherever I went so Amazing. I just didn't pass the team uh, we had this strength because of that strength as well well this guy left, left his mark so he created a weight room he, he changed the way we, we were the players you know I learned I grew this is the the goal you know and those two kind of sum it up because uh, it, at the end of the day it's not how much you know it's who you're going to become in order to fulfill your task as a father or as a coach or as a friend or as a member of this world you know, who you're going to become are you going to be the same dude that you are when you're 18 are you going to be a force of good are you going to be neutral which I hate or are you going to be a force of something bad yeah you know, being, being, being jealous and being uh, envious and, and all that stuff so who do you need to become in order to fulfill your goals that's the, the biggest I guess question for all of us and it kind of wraps up whatever we talked about education and, and interaction and all that so it's not what I need to learn it's what what who do I need to grow to amazing amazing coach thank you very much for your time for sharing your knowledge your experience uh, hope to meet you. I was not so melodramatic and philosophical. No, no, it was amazing. Uh, yeah. Very, very, very no. great experience. Hope to meet you soon, at the, if not before the summit, the summit for sure. Uh, thank you guys for watching. Please like, subscribe, comment, give us some advices, what to ask our guests to make it better. And see you next time. All right. Good night, everybody. Because it's night now. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Amazing coach, thank you very much. I won't bother you anymore. Thank you, so, thanks, yeah, thank have a nice night and uh, good luck in the in the season. Thank you so much, you too. Thank bye you. Bye. bye.